Greetings and welcome to our conversations on uh, COVID and development here at the Center for Global Development. And today, uh, it's my real pleasure to welcome uh, Rémi Rue, uh, who is the uh, head of the Agence Française de Développement and also is the chair of the uh, International Development Finance Club, which brings together a large number of uh, public banks, public development banks uh, around the world. And, and we'll have a chance to talk to Rami about uh, both what uh, AFT is doing and what this broader community of uh, uh, financial institutions are doing in response to the crisis. So, uh, welcome, uh, Rami. Hello, Masoud. Well, thanks a lot for the invitation. I'll do my best <laughs> yes. from Paris, where the the connection we're, we're is not really, very good. Though. We're really looking forward to this conversation. So, I thought, uh, I mean, before we get into the response, maybe it's better to start with what the private sector and businesses in Africa, in developing countries, are already uh, seeing in terms of the impact of the crisis. And what are your uh, staff who are working with so many partners in, in developing countries uh, conveying to you in terms of the way the crisis is impacting the private sector? And, uh, and then from there, we can go into how one should respond to that. But uh, always good to get a sense of what's happening on the ground. No, of course, um, we have about 100 uh, offices uh, uh, on the ground, of course. So, uh, and we kept uh, all our professionals there. Um, so, uh, even if we have, a, as as all of us, a lot of constraints on the way we operate, uh, we still have, um, uh, I would say, micro signals <laughs> on on what is what is happening. Um, well. In many zones, it's a, it's a perfect storm. Huh? Uh, so, you know, we're very uh, present uh, in the Sahel. So, on, on top of uh, uh, the security, um, the crisis, now you have uh, this uh, sanitary uh, threat um, and also uh, the effect of uh, initial lockdown on, on, on the economy. Uh, the same uh, with countries uh, with uh, well, fossil fuel reserves uh, that also that are also supporting uh, the shock created by the tension of this uh, on, on this market so somehow um, the global south um, is facing the same situation with one thing on top of that which is um, in, in Europe or in the US well we have central banks uh, providing the liquidity so for yeah. now the the crisis in the in the real economy because this is what we are talking about has not transferred uh, into the financial sector which is which is not the case uh, in uh, developing countries uh, so they are facing both uh, the reality with a different balance probably between uh, the sanitary uh, dimension and the economic and social uh, one uh, but also a lot of disturbance um, on uh, their 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 financing, and so this is where, of course, uh, they need uh, uh, international partners. Uh, both, I would say, at the macroeconomic level. So this is this is uh, the the work of of the IMF and and, and internationals. Um, and central banks, if, if possible. Uh, I know yeah. the Fed is, uh, is very active also in direction of the, the, the developing world. And they need also partners on, on the micro uh, side to transform uh, liquidities made available uh, into, uh, into concrete action, into projects. Yeah. So it's a very complex situation. And, and of course, um, uh, it's still unclear uh, how deep the crisis will be on the sanitary side. And so we've put face in the coming months uh, some sort of contradiction <laughs> between uh, countries in the north uh, that are, of course, deeply worried 
about um, health issues. Uh, yes. So putting their resources mostly into the health sector okay. and uh, leaders uh, in the South um, asking and speaking about uh, um, the private sector, about the economy, uh, because uh, hopefully uh, we don't know, of course, and I'm very cautious because the, the, the health crisis uh, will be different, I would say. Uh, I'm not saying that there is the, the, the disease is not there, because it is. Yes. But maybe the virus has a different, or because of the characteristic of the population, because of uh, many factors, we don't know. I'm not an epidemiologist, but it seems that uh, we do not understand <laughs> Uh, the, the exact uh, impact of this of this virus, uh, but but the economic the economy is is certainly hit very hard uh, everywhere. I think that's certainly the case, and you know even though there is a lot of uncertainty, as you say, on how the uh, the actual pandemic will evolve, how it will impact uh, different demographics of population in the in Africa, the people over 65 are uh, three three percent or five percent, whereas you know in Italy it's uh, 22 percent. So so clearly the demographics are very different. But but I think what is very clear already is that the economic impact is going to be enormous, and also the economic impact is going to be long lasting, and that their ability to respond to the economic impact is much more constrained for all the reasons that you said. They can't print the money and many of them can't go into the, most of them can't go into the market and start borrowing money currently because the markets are so risk averse. So you come back to a f one of the few certainties in this situation is that it is the international response of the official sector that will drive the outcome in terms of how bad the economic consequences are for poor countries. And, and I wanted to, you know, to get a little bit your take on that response, because you know, if you were to be generous about the uh, spring meetings of the IMF and World Bank and the G7 and the G20, you would say that well, everybody said the right things about how uh, unprecedented this crisis is. Uh, uh, they made a start in terms of uh, some debt service relief for the poorest countries for the next eight months uh, on their bilateral debt. And the international financial institutions all said that they would step up as best as they could their support. But if you were less generous, uh, as a reader of this, uh, you would say that actually uh, all this doesn't really add up at all in terms of the level of ambition to what is likely to be the enormous economic impact. And, and there is a glaring disconnect between the kind of response that we see within the rich countries and the level of ambition that we are currently seeing in terms of the international response. And you are, of course, sitting in the middle of it in terms of the interface between the macro and the micro. Uh, and you're also a very keen observer of the European scene. And I want to get a little bit your sense first of how do you see this response? And, and do you agree that, you know, with kind of my personal perception, which is that it's really still short of what is needed and we need to uh, find ways to galvanize the public and political uh, so engagement and consensus that will enable us to respond at the right level. But what's your take on that? Uh, my take on that is, um, well, for good reasons, uh, the initial uh, reaction is um, is national. So you, you care for your own people. Uh, and so, especially because the situation was so uncertain and, and we were all taken by, by surprise somehow, um, the, the, the governments, they, they, well, it took a long time for international cooperation uh, to start. Uh, but at, at least now, and that's the good news uh, with these meetings, I think the, the, the awareness is there, um, and we see uh, uh, leaders, so 
of course, my own president, uh, Macron, came, came strong, I think, and and we had this um, common position from um, in the Financial Times from African and European yes. um, heads of state. Uh, um, so the, the the movement, I would not say the momentum, maybe, but the movement uh, has uh, started. Uh, of course, uh, I, I fully agree with you that uh, um, public resources, uh, ODA, uh, or uh, what the IMF can provide um, is crucial. Well, of course, always the same. Uh, when you look at the various sources of uh, external financing for developing countries, uh, um, remittances um, and uh, FDI, uh, they are... Um, now bigger than ODA, but they are so strongly pro-cyclical uh, that they evaporate uh, in times of crisis. Uh, and they will come back, but for now, uh, there's this huge recess of resources, private resources, uh, I would say. Uh, and ODA, I'm not saying that it is counter-cyclical, uh, but at least it's not it's not pro cyclical. At least it's, it's stable. It's yeah. still there, and so it provides some sort of a, a cushion at least. And if we are more ambitious, it could play part of the of the counter cyclical. Well, we we will see the the figures uh, next year when it will all uh, add up. Yes. But probably what uh, the IMF is doing right now, uh, what the World Bank is uh, doing. Uh, and what we all we are all trying to mobilize, uh, hopefully we'll have uh, we we'll play that role. Um, on the on the answer, um, we pushed very hard uh, in Europe uh, to say something, um, and somehow I think this is a success. Uh, we were still debating on. Uh, how to deal with the pan pandemic uh, internally in Europe, yes. <laughs> with a lot of discussions, while uh, from, I would say, uh, the discussions I remember I called uh, Kunduns, the Director General for Development at the Commission. Uh, it was, I think, uh, March the 20th or something like that. And we started discussing, and, and there was a, a commitment, uh, both uh, by the Commission and by Member States. I think it was the week before uh, the IMF and the World Bank meeting, about 20, more than 20 billion uh, uh, euro uh, made, uh, made available. So at least I'm pleased that there was a European voice. It's always a challenge, <laughs> uh, not too late uh, in the crisis. And, and we are trying to build on that. Um, um, of course, keeping uh, UK on board and you know, as strong as we can uh, uh, to demonstrate uh, that uh, we are here. But that's only um, tens of billions. So you're right, it's not, uh, it's not up to the task uh, and that's that's where I agree with you. Uh, the, 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 the standstill, the moratorium on debt uh, was an important step, certainly. It's also, uh, it's also about 20, 20 billions if, uh, if uh, private creditors somehow follow. Um, we're not sure yet. Um, but, but we can regret uh, the, SDR, uh, the SDR answer. Uh, that was uh, much needed and that would have provided uh, more, uh, yes. about 30 billion for Africa if uh, 500 uh, issuance uh, or maybe more uh, yes. if, we, if we had pushed uh, the limits. So um, I, I hope that these discussions will, um, will come back. Uh, maybe next fall, um, uh, when Absolutely. we will, uh, when we will see the, the, the depth of it. So maybe missed uh, a missed occasion here uh, to react as uh, swiftly and ambitiously as uh, it was needed. But it's it's not over, and, and as I said, uh, there will be uh, forces uh, in the system uh, that will ask for it. At least that's the French. Uh, you know, that's the French position yeah. from the start. Huh? 
with Minister Le Maire and, 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 my, and my own president and the Treasury and all, all colleagues. Yeah. Um, so I thought maybe then this you know, kind of takes us to, in this response, AFD and the other uh, development finance uh, institutions, the public development banks, uh, have a particular role, uh, particularly in supporting the private sector. And, you know, I wanted to get a little bit of a sense of how you see the priorities uh, for your own interventions now, because, yeah. you know, one, one question is, do you deal, for example, mainly with existing clients, uh, and try to make sure that they survive, because in a way you have done the due diligence on them already. Uh, mm -hmm. Or is this the moment to try to go into helping people particularly the overwhelming majority of, of firms who are in the informal sector and, and how does one help mm. the informal sector in Africa and because uh, that's where also there are a lot of uh, women entrepreneurs are in the informal sector and 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 we want to make sure that in terms of a gender uh, lens being built into the response we find ways to reach out to them so uh, I just to maybe share a little bit Rami what's your and your colleagues thinking on, on how to structure the response to help the, the private sector, given so many competing needs and, and at the end of the day, you know, limited resources. Yes, uh, th that's what I, I, I started to phrase in my initial remark. I think we, we have to rush, we have to provide resources for health, for sure. And, 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 and I think we, we, we have all rebalanced our portfolio and activities, and, and it's possible this year because we know that, of course, we need additional resources, but we don't know if we will succeed in implementing the existing resources. So, yes. so there's a real uh, uh, value in uh, pushing for investments uh, in health and answering the needs of the government, for, for sure. But, but um, uh, I fully agree with you, uh, the, the issue of the private sector is not there uh, at the right level uh, on, uh, on our agenda. Uh, I was discussing it with, uh, I think you, you, you received uh, Philippe Le Wehrou, uh, uh, recently, and so of course what comes from the IFC uh, network is also extremely uh, worrying. And, uh, we have to keep in mind that the, the last time we uh, uh, rescheduled, we canceled debt, <laughs> um, and you were extremely active at that time, uh, Masoud. So uh, uh, the, the, the situation of the private sector was extremely different, uh, yes. especially in Africa. Uh, and, and so, of course, the resources uh, that were uh, liberated by uh, debt relief um, in the year 2000, they went uh, into infrastructure and other public investments. But at the same time, the, uh, the, the, the good macro um, and, and the good policies in Africa especially, it helped um, the emergence of a real African private sector for the last 20 years. Uh, and that's a real strength. Uh, and we have to um, not to come back. I'm thinking about the World Bank and the IMF. We probably have to design uh, the programs that will come with the crisis a bit differently from what they were 20 years ago. And, and pay a very, very close attention uh, to the protection uh, of uh, the private sector because it, it's there, but it's extremely fragile. And probably in a, a semester, maximum a year, if there's no um, appropriate answer, they will have all vanished. Huh? And if, if growth come back, <laughs> there will be nobody uh, to transform uh, resurgent growth into, uh, into jobs, uh, into uh, uh, resources for the, for, for the people. And, and uh, you're right, we have to find uh, Sponsors, uh, we have to organize something uh, with the financial institutions that know about the private sector. Uh, we're not so many um, uh, to um, put um, 
the spotlight uh, on this issue. And, and that's very micro. Huh? Uh, uh, the, the, the good news is that um, we have experienced, uh, we have a lot of instruments. So, of course, um, uh, there are credit lines um, in, the, in the banking sector uh, for SMEs. Uh, uh, we know and we helped a lot uh, microfinance institutions. And, of course, <laughs> That's absolutely crucial uh, to help um, macrofinance institutions uh, not to go bankrupt because there are uh, those that will touch uh, the informal sector and the villages and people uh, that will be most severely uh, hit by the crisis. We have a lot of uh, warranty instruments and, and Europe played a very innovative role. Now we have to pay attention to this, scale them up, um, and save as many uh, as many firms uh, as possible. So this is something we are we are building. Um, as you know, we will have um, a summit of uh, public development banks next November. So I really would like uh, that the this private sector uh, priority. And all the um, the array of financial instruments that is needed. Uh, it, it can be equity if there's a solvency problem. Can be a credit line if it's a liquidity problem. Can be guarantees because of course our institutions we are we try to be counter cyclical, but we also have to pay attention to our own balance sheets. So we need to yeah. be de-risked by um, by um, concessional resources. Uh, so, um, and of course, we also need uh, people going um, uh, into the firms uh, to help uh, entrepreneurs uh, to do the right thing. So it's 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 not macro; it's very micro uh, as a job uh, because of uh, the financial sector has um, failed and, and it cannot do it uh, by its own uh, for now. Yes. So, so yes, huge huge priority, and we are building something on that. Definitely. Absolutely. I, I, you know, it's quite interesting what you just said. That I don't think any of what we're going to be doing over the next two years to help particularly the poorest uh, countries recover is going to be straightforward. But at the macro level, in a way, at least, you know where the money's coming from and you know where the money should be going to and, and you have, you know, fairly centralized by nature, by definition, it's more centralized, you know, and then and then the one challenge is, well, once you've got the money in the hands of governments, how do you ensure that that money is used to provide cash transfers to those who need it and how do you use mobile banking uh, to ex to expand the range of cash transfers and how do you keep public services going? So th those are the sets of challenges at one side. And, but when we come to the private sector, in a way, um, because it is so granular and so micro, as you said, um, it's a bit harder to have a single recipe. You, know, you have many instruments and you have many different bits of the private sector, which all look very different one from the other. And, and you know, when you go and look at uh, uh, a, a, a small two-person business or a four-person business in the informal sector in the Sahel somewhere, that is going to be very different than looking at a 20-person firm in the, in the formal sector in the same economy and that's altogether different from thinking about the very large strategic companies in that we need to think about, you know, like the airlines in Africa. You would never think about TFI is getting very much involved in supporting national airlines, but now there is a legitimate question that if the airlines that serve Africa all go under in the next year because of lack of uh, business and lack of support, is that a, an acceptable outcome for the continent and for the world? You know, so so I think there are these very difficult and different uh, trade-offs that have to be faced. And I want to get a little bit to how you and other uh, 
international institutions that are working with the private sector are coming together to try and scope out what is the nature of the challenge and how do we think about this complex set of trade-offs in a more structured way? Is it country by country? Is it by looking at the instruments? Is it by looking at the type of institutions? Um, and then from there, I thought it would be great also if you could tell us a little bit more about this, the, the first summit of uh, uh, public development banks that you're planning in, in uh, uh, the end of the year, in, in November. And I, and I want to get a little sense of how we build up between now and then so that we can actually use that in a way to reach agreement on an agenda for the year or two years or three years that come thereafter building on what's been done between now and, and then. So, any thoughts on that? We need to connect the macro level <laughs> to, to the micro level. Yes. And, um, of course, um, in um, ad advanced economies, there's a lot of institutions uh, uh, that are doing it. Um, well, keep in mind that in, so there are models where these institutions are all private, nearly. That's the US <laughs> or, or UK. Uh, but keep in mind that in many countries, um, there are still, or there are also, or they are complementary to, to private uh, banks, uh, actors. There are public uh, financial institutions that somehow are uh, the glue uh, <laughs> between actors or, they are, or that are addressing uh, market failures uh, to reach the poorest or to finance uh, um, investments that are, are not uh, at the standards of uh, profitability that the private sector is expecting or um, or that are helping uh, territories that are not of interest of for them, but uh, and this is um, in our economies. You see, in a crisis like this COVID nineteen uh, event, you see them uh, expanding their balance sheet extremely rapidly. So, see what uh, KFW in Germany is doing. So, Minister Scholz at the very start of the crisis, he said, uh, "There's no upper limit to uh, KFW uh, lending." <laughs> So the, and that was uh, described as the, the German bazooka uh, yes. uh, to save uh, to save the the, the, the real economy. Invaluable um, private sector SMEs uh, that made uh, Germany and its uh, dynamism. In France, uh, we have an institution that is called BPI BPI France, the French government and the Parliament. Uh, Voted uh, 300 billion euro uh, guarantees uh, to guarantee loans uh, uh, to the to the French SMEs. So so we know there there are elements, and hopefully uh, our firms will pass uh, the crisis uh, and keep as many employees as possible uh, for now. So the question now is uh, how could we uh, uh, address uh, the difficulties uh, in developing countries where these instruments are not there. Uh, we know you said that uh, the local private sector is sometimes extremely uh, concentrated or or risk adverse, uh, or and um, there are public financial institutions, but they are not probably at scale or deployed, or they only uh, Finance uh, part uh, of what is needed could be infrastructure and not SMEs or agriculture. And so um, I think pushing uh, uh, a debate on what are the instruments uh, that are needed uh, to develop an economy, uh, financing of an economy basically. Uh, uh, and what is the uh, ideal type, uh, ideal type of a public bank uh, that is well managed, that is helpful, that is following the guidance of governments, and that is very close to the private sector? I think is of interest uh, and will come stronger in the coming months, uh, just because of what is of of what is uh, happening. Of course, you're right. There's a bit of ideology huh, there. 
because when we, when you talk about I, I, uh, I think that during ODA, a crisis during a crisis a lot of the ideology goes out of the window because That's you need to do what you hope. need to do my friend you know we are we are spending 8 trillion dollars uh, here and uh, central banks are uh, offering to take on kinds of obligations that would have been anathema uh, to them a while ago so i think in the middle of a crisis you need to preserve your values but you need to dump your ideology so that's my that's my hope uh, and that's my work uh, you published a paper saying uh, no regret, so no regret. Huh? <laughs> Let's try all we can, but but it, it means that what is uh, already happening, meaning uh, using part of ODA resources for the private sector. Okay, we, we are all saying uh, it's helpful, uh, now let's do it. <laughs> uh, and uh, without second, uh, second thoughts. Uh, of course, there's a stigma attached to public banks. Of course, uh, people think that uh, it's better to finance your economy through through the private sector and private finance. Okay, but these instruments, they are there. They are not perfect, but they will try to do their best in the crisis. What's the best uh, use of them and how to organize them? So that's, that's the idea of uh, this uh, summit. Uh, so. Um, uh, it started, of course, a few months ago um, on, on uh, I would say, uh, the structural role of public banks, meaning uh, SDGs and climate. The, the idea initially was we have COP26, uh, we have COP15 on biodiversity, uh, we have the gender agenda. How could we push this public institution towards Agenda 2030, uh, basically, and, and demonstrate that uh, there are forces um, in so many constituencies, uh, deeply uh, rooted, national, that could connect to the international agenda and support multilateralism uh, and make it happen. So that's that's it's still there. But now there's this, there's a second rational <laughs> on top of it, which in my view makes the summit even more important. Is as I said. Uh, all these institutions, and for instance, we published a communique from uh, IDFC a few days ago with an annex explaining what, uh, I don't know, about 18 members of IDFC are doing in the crisis. Uh, and you see all of them, uh, VEB in Russia, uh, the China Development Bank, the NDS, they are all doing a lot uh, and, and ready to do more if uh, their government uh, is asking them. So we will try to explain uh, both the, the counter cyclical value of this group and uh, while keeping in mind that uh, uh, we have to engage in this uh, just uh, transition um, and transformation of our economies and, and, and explain our governments. Because sometimes the governments, they don't know yeah. <laughs> that they have these instruments at their disposition yeah. at their, uh, and that's, uh, and, and I'm pretty sure they don't know what um, this, the, the addition of all these, these institutions could mean. Yeah. Because when you tell someone that there, there are 450 public development banks in the world, of course, you, you take the multilateral layer, you take the regional layer, you take the national institutions, and you also take the sub-national institutions. Yes. In Brazil, uh, there, are 20, there are 21 public development banks in Brazil, mostly at the, at the local uh, yes. level. And, and nobody is thinking um, uh, of this group um, as a system, uh, uh, yes. trying to guide it, uh, trying to put the concessional resources where much needed to have the maximum uh, cooperation and, and impact. So uh, uh, we have just finished last week, so we announced uh, the summit. Uh, we now have the, the support of uh, the 450. So uh, they are all extremely excited <laughs> to convene physically or virtually, well, we'll see. Uh, we have um, an ongoing work uh, from um, the Academia, 
So Columbia, University of Peking, University of Cordoba, Toulouse, uh, a lot of uh, researchers uh, are working. Uh, yourself at CGDev, you, you published a report last, last year on, on IDFC, uh, thanks to you. Uh, and of course, um, the idea of the summit is um, it's not uh, it's not a pro domo manifestation. I mean, that's, that's not interesting. Uh, it's really um, seeing the group for the first time, uh, pushing this group to organize itself, to cooperate more, and challenge it. Uh, I want to have uh, you, Masood. I want to have uh, private bankers. I want to have uh, uh, civil society, um, uh, people trying to help us identify uh, what is our um, thesis, uh, yes. what is our usefulness, what is our val where, where, added where value. Where do you add value? What is the compelling exactly. proposition yeah. that you bring to the table? You know, that's an, as, and as public, in this environment. Uh, as public institutions. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and of course, there are gaps uh, in the system. There are, there is, there are overlaps uh, in the system. And hopefully, the, this dialogue uh, will help us identify them. And the summit, for me, is only a start. Uh, and have this community, this coalition, uh, uh, be uh, conscious of its uh, duty, its role, and better itself uh, over, over time. And of course, it's not. It's really to support uh, multilateralism, in my view. It's really yes. to have uh, forces internally uh, that that want uh, to align, uh, to align because now because of SDGs, for the first time, these uh, these hundreds of institutions, I think they all feel they have the same mandate. Of course, they are very heterogeneous. Uh, uh, geographically, uh, because sometimes, they, as I said, they're only financing agriculture or infrastructure. But at the end of the day, uh, they turn to the UN SDGs and, and to the Paris Agreement in the end. Yeah. And now, they, of course, the, the crisis is another thread uh, that is linking in all that of them. Agenda. So, so I want to end a little bit by going beyond the next two years. And you remember, I mean, that uh, when we last were talking a few months ago in Paris, uh, you know, we were very much focused on how the whole of the international financial system, public and private, could be used as a lever to accelerate the delivery of the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agenda, so you know, making everything. Uh, climate compatible, thinking about other public bad like biodiversity that would follow. And this was very much a sort of part of the of the energy and momentum that you and uh, a lot of colleagues, uh, uh, including uh, you know your uh, other ministries in in France and elsewhere, and, and uh, President Macron had been personally shepherding. And now you know everybody's focused on pandemic in the near term, the response to the pandemic, the recovery from the pandemic, and then building global health security architecture that will be stronger in the face of future pandemics. And clearly, that's an underinvested area in the world that we need to address. But how do you see this impacting the energy and momentum behind the other looming global crisis, which hasn't gone away, which of course is a consequence of, of climate change. And, and how do we, thinking about development finance going forward, ensure that it's looking at it as a totality of the challenges that development faces uh, and doesn't become uh, exclusively or disproportionately focused on the latest crisis, which in our case happens to be an enormous crisis, of mm -hmm. course, which is the current one. Yes, I remember uh, Bill Easterle's uh, book, uh, The Elusive 
quest for growth, if I'm right, yes. explaining that each chapter was about a decade and uh, infrastructure, then uh, governance, uh, then debt relief, then uh, um, so I think the, the, the beauty, the strength, the mystery of uh, SDGs uh, um, and probably why this um, this uh, message of 2015 is, is still has this power and is, is deploying is that we somehow we came out, we escaped from uh, these uh, trends. Uh, um, and um, uh, the value of SDGs is uh, the 17 of them. Uh, the 17th is important. <laughs> But what, what we want to do at the summit in November is illustrate the value of SDG 17. A uh, group of uh, public development banks is certainly a very, very promising uh, incarnation, a vision, a vision of uh, what, what it means. Um, of course, SDGs for me means two things. It means um, as we uh, phrased it uh, in the Paris Agreement, uh, I remember when we negotiated it, uh, it means trajectories. Uh, so it means, uh, again, like we did in the past, uh, pushing the countries, discussing with the countries for them to set uh, long-term trajectories. Uh, on all dimensions of uh, development and sustainable development. And, and we absolutely need a multilateral institution that is um, accountable, responsible uh, uh, of this uh, long-term vision. Uh, we had it in the past when we canceled debt, as I reminded. Uh, we are still missing this institution uh, since uh, 2015, and, and, I, and I pretty hope that this is very important because I see the debate between uh, about the day after the crisis, <laughs> but uh, we will never find a solution in the day after if we don't know uh, the day after the day after. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, because of course the day the day after the crisis we need a lot of compromises. You, you, you were mentioning airlines. I mean, of course, you, now you see there's a debate. Uh, on one side, you say we have to stop financing airlines. Uh, and on the other side, you, you have a tendency saying, OK, no strings attached to saving uh, airlines. Uh, and, and the truth probably is somewhere in between, uh, but guided by what we think about uh, the, what the sector uh, will become the day after the day after. And, and of course, we cannot ask probably the private sector. Uh, it has to be guided by, by governments uh, and by uh, international uh, organization, this reflection. And the second point is uh, um, uh, we, we have to host uh, this SDG uh, vision spirit uh, as much as we can in our operations as well. So at IFD, for instance, we have um, developed um, an opinion and uh, we uh, grade uh, projects uh, regarding uh, the various dimensions of sustainable development. Uh, so, so it's a way to see you know, SDGs. Uh, and of course, the, the, we see the balance, uh, the positive contribution or the negative contribution to SDGs, and we try uh, to um, have the best and finance the best possible uh, projects. And if we are able to demonstrate that the trajectories are consistent, that's the macro level, and we do our best to have uh, quality investments, that's the micro level, then you can host an event like COVID-19 yes. uh, and you can be agile between priorities because you, uh, you know that you, you will not lose the climate track because you are financing health in 2020. Uh, because it's, it's ingrained, it's, uh, it's in a strategy as well as uh, the procedures of uh, financial institutions. 
But this is what we try to do. Of course, it doesn't answer your other points, which is uh, um, the, the, that's about quality. <laughs> uh, the other the other question is quantity. Of course, you have to be uh, uh, you have to be credible enough to have this dialogue. Uh, and not to do uh, very little perfect things, because in the end, uh, the projects that we finance or the instrument we put in place, they have to mobilize uh, private finance uh, and other actors. Uh, otherwise, uh, we will do a sum of perfect things, but we will, know, we will not contribute to do the things right. <laughs> uh, and, and that's where our instruments are, um, uh, what we are thinking uh, right now. Yes, thank, thank you. Everybody. So I was going to say, just for the benefit of those who are having difficulty remembering SDG 17, is to remind you is that it is the goal that recognizes oh, the need to bring partnerships together and, and national, international, private sector, public sector to 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 ensure that we strengthen and achieve progress towards the other goals. So it is the basis on which, in a way, we can mobilize the, the collective energies and, and resources uh, of the world. And I think in today's world, in some ways, you know, this crisis actually demonstrates, if we needed any demonstration, of why it is going to be essential in our interconnected world to find ways to build the necessary alliances and partnerships to tackle global banks, because we cannot solve the problems without the partnerships that will help us to to actually address the nature of these problems which which are increasingly global so i think we have a, a challenging year ahead and a challenging period ahead so Rumi, i want to thank you for taking the time and uh, i wish you all the best for the coming months and uh, i'm looking forward to engaging with you hopefully in person at the summit that you are organizing towards the end of the year, and if not, uh, we will find other ways to stay in touch. Thank you again for your time. You're most welcome. Thanks for the invitation, Masood, and to all colleagues at CGDEV. You're fantastic. Thank you. Thank you.